A very good evening aspirants. I welcome you all to the Hindu daily news analysis brought to you by Shankarai's Academy. A kind request to you all aspirants, those who have not subscribed our YouTube channel, do subscribe and hit the bell icon button to get regular notifications about our future videos. Now before getting into discussion, I have two important announcements to you. The first announcement is regarding Chakra initiative. Shankarai's Academy is going to start current affairs class in the name of Chakra initiative. Under this initiative, we will provide 50 plus current affairs sessions, 5 rapid revision sessions and 9 tests. As you all know, current affairs is inevitable part when it comes to UPSC civil service exam preparation. So aspirants, make use of this opportunity and boost your current affairs preparation. The brochure for this initiative is provided in the description column. You can view that to get detailed information. Now coming to the second initiative, this is regarding prelims test series. Batch 3 of Shankarai's Academy's prelim test series is about to begin. The orientation session for batch 3 will be conducted on 16th November and the first test will be on 22nd November. A total of 48 tests including mark and CSAT will be provided in the test series. The test will be conducted both in online and offline mode. So go and register to the test series immediately and boost your prelim score. With these announcements, let us get into the daily news analysis. Today I am going to cover important news articles from the Hindu newspaper dated 29th and 30th of October 2023. Displayed here is a list of news articles that we will be discussing today. At the end of the video, we will also have prelims practice question discussions. So try to watch the entire video. Now let us get into our first news article discussion. Look at this news article. Currently, the Tamil Nadu government provides financial assistance to the tune of rupees 18,000 as maternity benefit for pregnant women. Of the 18,000, 3,000 is provided by the union government under the Pradhan Mantri Matru Vandana Yojana. The balance 15,000 is provided by the Tamil Nadu state government under the Dr. Muthulakshmi Reddy Maternity Benefit Scheme. The issue highlighted in this news article is that the center's share of rupees 3,000 has been pending for some time. So the Tamil Nadu health minister promised that the issue would be sorted out within a month. This is all about the news article given here. Now in this context, let us see some important points about Pradhan Mantri Matru Vandana Yojana that is PMMVY. Now first let us see why this scheme was implemented. See in India, 1 in 3 women are undernourished and 1 in 2 women are anemic. In addition to this, due to poor economic background, many women in India work up to the last days of pregnancy. This also adds to their undernourishment. An undernourished mother almost inevitably gives birth to a low birth weight baby. This means that undernourishment transfers from one generation to the other. So to address this issue, the government launched the Pradhan Mantri Matru Vandana Yojana. Pradhan Mantri Matru Vandana Yojana, which is in short known as PMMEY, is a maternity benefit program. It is a centrally sponsored scheme implemented by the Ministry of Women and Child Development. So for this scheme, the funds are shared between the center and the states in the ratio of 60 to 40 respectively. Note that Pradhan Mantri Matru Vandana Yojana replaced the erstwhile Indira Gandhi Matru Tava Sagayog Yojana. Okay. This is the basics of the scheme. Now moving on to say about the objectives of Pradhan Mantri Matru Vandana Yojana. The first objective of the scheme is to improve the health seeking behavior of pregnant women and lactating mothers. Here, health seeking behavior means the actions that the people take to look after their health. So, PMMEY aims to improve this behavior in pregnant women and lactating mothers. This is the first objective. The second objective of the PMMEY is to provide partial compensation for the wage loss faced by mothers due to pregnancy. See, both these objectives in turn aims to address undernourishment in pregnant women and lactating mothers. This is all about the objectives of the scheme. Now, who are the intended benefits of the scheme? See, all pregnant and breastfeeding mothers are eligible for the scheme. But there is one exemption. If any woman who works for the government or who receives similar maternity benefits from other laws, then they are not eligible to receive benefits under the Pradhan Mantri Matra Vandana Yojana. Okay. This is all about the beneficiaries. Now, let us see the important features of this scheme. PMMEY is basically a conditional cash transfer scheme. Under the scheme, the government deposits Rs. 5000 directly to the 
bank or post office account of pregnant women and lactating mothers here note that out of 5000 3000 will be sponsored by the central government and the remaining 2000 will be given by the state government also there is no restriction to the state government for providing cash beyond 2000 rupees for example the tamil nadu government provides 15000 under the dr muthulakshmi reddy maternity benefit scheme in addition to the central government share of 3000 under the pradhan mantri matru vandana yojana okay see under the pmmuy 5000 rupees is provided in three installments the first installment of rupees 1000 is provided after the registration of pregnancy at danganwadi centers the second installment of rupees 2000 is provided after 6 months of pregnancy on receiving at least one antenatal checkup and the last installment of rupees 2000 is provided after child birth is registered and the child has received the first cycle of bcg opv dpt and hepatitis b vaccines see if you look at each installment there is some conditions that is why i mentioned pmm ui as a conditional cash transfer scheme also note that in addition to the 5000 rupees the eligible beneficiaries also receive rupees 1000 for institutional delivery under janani suraksha yojana okay these are the important features of pradhan mantri matru vandana yojana scheme see the scheme was launched in 2017 when the scheme was launched the benefit was restricted only to the first child but in 2022 certain changes were made in 2022 the pmmvy was made a component under the sub scheme samarthiya of the newly launched mission shakti here mission shakti is an umbrella scheme for safety security and empowerment of women from 2022 the benefits of the scheme will be provided to women for the first two living children provided the second child is a girl for the first child the cash incentive will be provided in two installments and for the second child the incentive will be provided as a single installment right after childbirth also before 2022 in case of miscarriage or stillbirths the mother cannot claim benefits under the pradhan mantri matru vandana yojana for the next child but after 2022 this provision was removed so now if there is a miscarriage or stillbirths the mother can claim benefits under the pradhan mantri matru vandana yojana for the next child okay that is all regarding pradhan mantri matru vandana yojana in this discussion we saw about why this particular scheme was launched then we saw about the objectives of the pradhan mantri matru vandana yojana then we saw about important features of the scheme and finally we saw some points about the important changes made in the scheme see the scheme is very important for your prelims exam so make note of each and every points that we discussed now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this news article this article is taken from the science page of yesterday's newspaper this article is about chimpanzees see a new study on female chimpanzees in uganda shows a sign of menopause in female chimpanzees see menopause is the time that marks the end of menstrual cycles in female during and after the menopause stage the females are naturally not able to become pregnant now coming back to the research on chimpanzees the research identified that female chimpanzees in uganda experiences menopause so they can't able to produce babies after certain years however they continue to live long after menopause okay this is the findings on chimpanzees see this finding is significant because it might help us to understand why menopause is such a rare trait in the animal kingdom see menopause is only observed in a few species such as humans and in some kinds of whales so studying menopause in wild chimpanzees could provide valuable insights into the evolution of menopause trait in humans okay this is all about the news article now in this discussion let us learn some points about chimpanzees first of all know that chimpanzees are referred to as closest living relatives to humans this is because the chimpanzees share over 98% of their dna with humans now coming to the habitat and distribution of chimpanzees see chimpanzees are not native to india they can be seen only in african continent chimpanzees inhabit tropical rainforests and savannas of equatorial africa 
they are primarily found in the forests of central and west africa okay now coming to the diet the chimpanzees are primarily herbivores that is it feed on materials from trees and plants but sometimes the chimpanzees hunt small animals like monkeys for their food now let us see the threats faced by the chimpanzees the primary threats to chimpanzee populations are habitat destruction due to deforestation human encroachment and the illegal wildlife trade they are mainly hunted for bush meat here bush meat refers to raw or minimally processed meat that is obtained from hunting wild animals see bush meat is a good source of income in rural africa so chimpanzees are vulnerable for the bush meat hunting so because of these wide threats the chimpanzees are listed as endangered species in the iucn red list of threatened species this is all about the threats and conservation status about chimpanzees now finally let us see some interesting things about chimpanzees see chimpanzees are generally compared with humans this is because the chimpanzees have a complex system of communication including vocalizations gestures and facial expressions like humans also chimpanzees are highly intelligent and capable of solving a variety of problems and puzzles they demonstrate cognitive abilities and have excellent long term memory in addition to this the chimpanzees also use tools just like humans for example they use sticks to extract termites from the ground also they use rocks to open nuts apart from this chimpanzees have demonstrated self awareness as seen in the mirror test see chimpanzees can recognize themselves in a mirror which suggests a level of self consciousness in the chimpanzees okay this is all about the interesting things about chimpanzees and that's all regarding this discussion and this discussion is all about the habitat and distribution of chimpanzees then we saw about the threats faced by the chimpanzees and finally we saw some fun facts about chimpanzees now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this editorial article this article is written by the chairperson of the congress party it is written in the context of the ongoing conflict between israel and the hamas in this editorial the author highlights the impact of the ongoing conflict on humanity and the steps that can be taken to bring a long lasting solution to the conflict okay this is the crux of this editorial now in this context let us take up a mains question regarding war and we will try to solve it now look at the question the question is war and associated violence are posing a consistent threat to the survival of humanity in this slide analyze the various impacts of war on humanity suggest some steps to safeguard humanity in the event of war 250 words 15 marks see the keyword in this question is analyze so we have to look at the various components of the topic or issue in detail then we have to provide insightful interpretations and explanations about the components this should be done to showcase to the evaluator your understanding of the topic or the issue also you have to ensure that your analysis is supported by reliable and verifiable sources so this is how you have to approach a question when the keyword or the directive analyze is given now let us see how to approach this specific question see this is actually a very simple question there are two components first we have to analyze the impacts of war on humanity and then we have to suggest some steps to protect humanity in the event of war this is how we are going to approach this particular question see this question can be asked in gs paper 2 under the topic of effect of policies and politics of developed and developing countries on india's interests and it also comes under the topic of important international institutions agencies and fora their structure and mandate so the particular topic that we are going to discuss now is come under these two syllabus topics this is about the syllabus now let us start answering the question now first let us take up the introduction see in the introduction part you can write about the reasons for war while writing about the reasons you can link it with some examples the intro can be like wars can arise due to a number of complex interconnected factors like territorial disputes ideological differences resource scarcity religion or ethnicity nationalism colonial legacy and geopolitical power struggle 
See while mentioning these reasons in the introduction, please try to provide some examples. See you can mention about the ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas as an example of territorial dispute. In case of ideological differences, you can mention about the various proxy wars that is Vietnam War or Korean War that happened during the Cold War period. For resource scarcity, you can mention about the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. And for ethnicity, you can mention about the Hutu and Tutsi conflict that led to the Rwanda Civil War. In case of nationalism, you can mention about the wars fought by the Serbs, Croatians and Bosnians for their independence from the Yugoslav state. In case of colonial legacy, you can mention about the Indochina War of 1962. And finally for geopolitical power struggle, you can mention about the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Okay, So you can use few of the points that we discussed in the introduction. Also note that by providing examples along with reasons for war will convey to the evaluator that you have strong basics and also you are well versed in important world events. Okay, This is all about the introduction part. Now coming to the main body of the answer, see in the first part of the answer we must analyze the impacts of the war. See everyone even non-serious candidates can write 5 to 6 valid points about the impacts of war. Here how can you differentiate your answer and get more marks? The key is subheading. Instead of randomly listing out the impacts of war, you use subheadings and make your answer more organized. Also using subheading will help you generate diverse points. In the case of this question, you can subdivide the impacts of war into humanitarian impacts, socio-economic impacts, political impacts, environmental impacts and psychological and mental health impacts. Okay, So this can be a subheading for this question. Now first let us take up humanitarian impacts. In humanitarian impacts, you can mention about loss of life. As we all know, both military personnel and civilians suffer casualties during wars. This leads to a significant loss of life. See, according to the United Nations, the Russia-Ukraine war has so far claimed around 14,000 lives. Okay, This is all about loss of life. Then the next impact is displacement. See, war often results in mass displacement of populations creating a refugee crisis. According to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, more than 14 million Syrians have been forced to flee their homes in search of safety due to the Syrian civil war. Of the 14 million, more than 6.8 million Syrians remain internally displaced in their own country. Okay. Then the next impact is health crisis. During war, access to health care becomes limited. This leads to an increase in disease, malnutrition and overall deterioration of public health. For example, the International Committee of the Red Cross reports that during the Yemen civil war, the prevalence of preventable diseases such as cholera resulted in the loss of thousands of lives. Okay. And lastly, you can mention about the human rights abuses. War can lead to violations of human rights including atrocities such as genocide, torture and sexual violence. The major example of human right abuses is the Holocaust propagated by the German Nazi party during World War II. This Holocaust lead to the death of around 6 million Jews. Okay, So these are all some of the humanitarian impacts of war. Now moving on to socio-economic impacts. Here firstly you can mention about the destruction of infrastructure. During war basic infrastructure such as roads, bridges, schools, hospitals and communication networks can be severely damaged. See according to the United Nations Department of Operational Support due to Russia-Ukraine war, the total infrastructure damage in Ukraine has crossed 100 billion US dollars. Okay. And next you can mention about the disruption caused due to education. See this mainly happens due to destruction of schools and displacement of teachers. The next impact is economic instability. War disrupt economies. It leads to unemployment, inflation, poverty and a decline in overall economic development. For example, the Syrian economy has contracted significantly with the GDP declining by an estimated 60 to 70 percentage since the start of Syrian civil war. Then the last major socio-economic impact is the destruction of social fabric. See, war leads to the breakdown of trust and cooperation. The Armenian genocide propagated by the 
Ottoman Empire during World War One is an example of how war leads to breakdown of trust and cooperation. Okay, so these are all some of the socio-economic impacts of war. Now moving on to political impacts. Firstly, wars can lead to the collapse of governments. This can lead to the rise of political instability. Then international power dynamics can change as a result of wars. See post Cold War II, the US and the USSR emerged as global superpowers. In some cases, war also resulted in growth of extremist ideologies. The classic example is the growth of Nazi party post World War I. Okay. So these are all some of the political impacts of war. Now moving on to say about environmental impacts. Firstly, war can lead to the destruction of natural habitats, pollution, deforestation and the depletion of natural resources. Also sometimes countries might adopt scorched earth policy to deny advantage to advancing forces. Here scorched earth policy is a military strategy of destroying everything that allows an enemy to be able to fight a war including water, food, humans, animals, plants and any kinds of tools and infrastructure. See Russia followed scorched earth policy during the Napoleonic Wars. Although this policy might provide short term military gains, in the long term it might lead to food insecurity and famine in war affected regions. And finally the use of chemical weapons, landmines and other hazardous materials during the war can lead to environmental contamination. This leads to long term risks to public health and the ecosystem. Okay, So these are all the environmental impacts of war. Now lastly let us look at the psychological and mental health impacts. Firstly, soldiers and civilians often experience post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of witnessing the horrors of war. Also, living in a war-torn environment can lead to increased levels of anxiety, depression and other mental health disorders. Lastly, prolonged exposure to violence can desensitize individuals to human suffering. That is, the people will get used to human suffering so much that they will no longer be affected by it. And this will lead to a diminished sense of empathy and compassion in humans. Okay, so these are all some of the impacts of war. You can use these points to address the first part of the question. Now coming to the second part. In this part we are going to provide some suggestions to protect humanity in the event of war. See here also the points can be divided into two parts. Firstly you can list out the steps that can be taken before the war starts. And then you can list the steps that can be taken in the event of war. Now first let us see the steps that can be taken pre-war. Firstly you can mention about economic integration. See when countries are economically integrated, they won't get into war that easily. For example let us take India and China. See India and China have their differences. But since their economies are deeply integrated, they will not go into war easily. This is because Economic integration promotes economic interdependencies which leads to stability. Okay, this is the first step. Then you can mention about arms control and promoting disarmament. This will promote global peace and security. Then you can mention about utilizing international organizations such as the United Nations to facilitate conflict resolution and mediation between conflicting parties. Lastly, you can mention that Promoting values of human rights and democracy will help to prevent potential conflict. Okay, so these are all some of the steps that can be taken pre-war. Now moving forward, let us see the steps that can be taken during the war time. Here first you can mention that steps must be taken to extend humanitarian aid and assistance to the affected populations. Food, medical supplies and shelter must be extended to mitigate the impact of war on civilians. Then you can mention that international laws regarding human rights must be respected to safeguard the civilians, refugees and prisoners of war. Then you can mention that the United Nations can impose sanctions on the aggressor. Also you can mention that a ceasefire must be established using international cooperation. And steps must be taken to deploy international peacekeeping forces in conflict zones to facilitate ceasefire agreements and to protect civilians. And finally, the international community must come together and help rebuild the countries affected by war. Okay, so these are all some of the steps that can be taken during the wartime to protect 
humanity okay now we have addressed the question quite satisfactorily now coming to the conclusion part in the conclusion you can mention the famous quote by martin luther king junior the quote is in spite of temporary victories violence never brings permanent peace so to protect humanity from the ill effects of war the world nations must choose dialogue and diplomacy over guns and tanks because only dialogue will bring about long lasting solutions okay so you can mention some points like this in the conclusion okay and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion through the mains answer writing approach we discussed about the reasons of war then we saw about the impacts of war on various perspectives and finally we saw some steps that can be taken to protect humanity from the war now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this news article this article is taken from yesterday's newspaper it talks about lack of conservation of pallava paintings the news report says that the 1300 year old paintings in a pallava era temple in vilupuram district of tamil nadu have suffered severe damage those ancient paintings are in a deteriorating state so there is an urgent need for their preservation and restoration okay this is all about the news now in this context let us discuss about pallava art and architecture in detail now first let us see some basics about pallavas pallavas were one of the ancient rulers of south india they ruled mainly the northern part of tamil nadu the northern part of tamil nadu is called tondai mandalam in ancient days the pallava rule lasted approximately from 560 ad to 906 ad around 906 ad they were replaced by the imperial cholas see pallavas left behind many inscriptions and monuments although the pallava kings were mostly saivate they also constructed several vaishnava shrines in some pallava era temples several inscriptions related to buddhism and jainism are also seen this portrays the influence of buddhism and jainism on pallava kings note that the pallavas are the main reason behind the dravidian style of temple architecture okay now with these basics let us see the features of pallava architecture one of the main characteristic features of pallava architecture is the use of intricate and detailed relief sculptures most of these sculptures depicts scenes from hindu epics mythological stories and various deities the sculptures are seen on temple walls and facades okay see in the early phase most of the pallava temples were rocket structures in the later phase the pallavas built structural temples now what is the difference between rocket and structural temples in case of rocket temples the temple is carved out of a whole rock block whereas in case of structural temples it is built using blocks of rocks okay this is the difference now let us see in detail about rocket phase and structural phase of pallava architecture now first let us take the rocket phase the rocket phase of pallava architecture lasted from 610 ad to 668 ad this phase includes two groups of monuments such as the mahendra group and the mamalla group now first let us see about mahendra group the mahendra group of monuments were constructed during the reign of mahendra varman 1 the monuments mainly consists of pillared halls carved into mountain faces these halls are similar to jain temples of that time some of the notable examples of mahendra group of monuments include the cave temples at mandagapattu pallavaram and mamandur okay now coming to the mamalla group of monuments see these structures had emerged from 630 ad to 668 ad the monuments were built during narasimhavarman 1 who is also called as mamalla these structures featured the construction of free standing monolithic shrines called radhas alongside the pillared halls some of the best known examples of mamalla group style are the panjarathas and arjuna's penance at mahabalipuram this is all about the rocket phase of pallava architecture now we shall see the structural phase of pallava architecture see this phase is divided into two groups such as 
த ராஜசிம்ஹா குரூப் அண்ட் த நந்திவர்மன் குரூப் நோ ஃபோர்ஸ் லெட் அஸ் டேக் ராஜசிம்ஹா குரூப் ஆஃப் டெம்பிள்ஸ் தீஸ் டெம்பிள்ஸ் வேர் பில்ட் பை நரசிம்மவர்மன் டூ ஹூ இஸ் நோன் அஸ் ராஜசிம்ஹா திஸ் குரூப் இன்க்ளூட்ஸ் தி ஏர்லி ஸ்ட்ரக்சரல் டெம்பிள்ஸ் ஆஃப் த பல்லவாஸ் மார்க்டு பை எ லாட் ஆஃப் ஆர்கிடெக்சுரல் எக்ஸ்பிரிமெண்டேஷன் சம் ஆஃப் த நோட்டபிள் டெம்பிள்ஸ் ஃப்ரம் திஸ் பீரியட் இன்க்ளூட் த ஷோர் டெம்பிள் அட் மகாபலிபுரம் அண்ட் த காஞ்சி கைலாசநாதர் டெம்பிள் அட் காஞ்சிபுரம் நவ் கம்மிங் டு த நந்திவர்மன் குரூப் ஆஃப் டெம்பிள்ஸ் தே வேர் பில்ட் பை நந்திவர்மன் டூ தி இம்பார்ட்டன்ட் மோனியூமெண்ட் பில்ட் டூரிங் த ரேன் ஆஃப் நந்திவர்மன் டூ இஸ் வைகுந்த பெருமாள் டெம்பிள் அட் காஞ்சிபுரம் ஓகே சி பல்லவா ஆர்கிடெக்சர் ரீச் இட்ஸ் ஃபுல் மெச்சூரிட்டி டூரிங் திஸ் பீரியட் அண்ட் இட்ஸ் சர்வ்ட் ஆஸ் எ மாடல் ஃபார் லேட்டஸ்ட் ஸ்ட்ரக்சர்ஸ் லைக் த பிரகதீஸ்வரர் டெம்பிள் ஆஃப் சோலாஸ் இன் தஞ்சாவூர் அண்ட் சம் அதர் நோட்டபுள் ஆர்கிடெக்சுரல் ஒர்க்ஸ் ஓகே அண்ட் தட்ஸ் ஆல் ரிகார்டிங் திஸ் டிஸ்கஷன் திஸ் டிஸ்கஷன் இஸ் அபவுட் த பேசிக்ஸ் ஆஃப் பல்லவாஸ் தென் யூஸ் அபவுட் த கேட்டஸ்டிக் ஃபீச்சர்ஸ் ஆஃப் பல்லவா ஆர்ட் அண்ட் ஆர்கிடெக்சர் அண்ட் ஃபைனலி விஸ் ஆர் சம் பாயிண்ட்ஸ் அபவுட் த டூ ஃபேஸஸ் ஆஃப் பல்லவா ஆர்கிடெக்சர் தட் இஸ் த ராக் கட் ஃபேஸ் அண்ட் ஸ்ட்ரக்சரல் ஃபேஸ் சி திஸ் டாபிக் இஸ் வெரி மச் இம்பார்ட்டன்ட் ஃபார் யுவர் ப்ரிலம்ஸ் எக்ஸாம் so revise all the facts that we discussed now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this article this article is taken from the faq page of yesterday's newspaper this article speaks about the criminal procedure identification act the news is that under this act the central government is going to launch dna and face matching systems at 1300 locations across the country the system can be used by the central investigation agencies and the state police departments okay this is the background of this article now in our discussion let us understand important points mentioned in this news article now let us start with the criminal procedure identification act the criminal procedure identification act which is in short called as crpi act was passed by the parliament in april 2022 this act enables the state police organizations and central investigation agencies to collect store and analyze physical and biological samples of the arrested persons note that the samples even include retina and iris scans of arrested persons as per the act the records about collected samples could be stored for 75 years see despite the act being enacted in 2022 that has not been implemented completely this is because there was a delay in framing guidelines and standard operating procedures to implement crpi act note that national crime records bureau that is the ncrb is the nodal agency for implementing crpi act the ncrb is still in the process of preparing the guidelines and sop to implement this act this is why that has not been implemented completely okay now coming to the question why do we need this kind of legislation see before the passing of crpi act in april 2022 a 100 year old british era legislation named identification of prisoners act 1920 was governing the criminal identification system in india this particular act had a problem of limited scope the identification of prisoners act had a provision for recording finger and food print impressions then photographs of certain categories of convicted persons and impressions of non convicted persons based on the orders of magistrate however this act is not allowed to take critical samples such as retina and iris scans and there was also no provision for the usage of modern tools or techniques to capture body measurements but the new crpi act allows the use of modern tools and techniques to capture and record appropriate body measurements apart from this the crpi act also expanded the scope of samples to include retina and iris scans of arrested persons okay now moving on to say about the role of ncrb under the criminal procedure identification act the national crime records bureau that is ncrb plays a central role in the dna and face matching systems in our country the ncrb will prescribe the specifications of the devices that are to be used for taking measurements in both the formats that are physical and digital format 
it also prescribes the method for handling and storing measurements by the state police departments in addition to this the ncrb will store process disseminate and destroy records of various measurements note that the impressions taken at any police station will be stored in a common database maintained by the ncrb this database will be assessed by authorized police and prison officials across the country okay now let us see who can take the measurements the crpa act empowers the police and prison officials to take physical and biological measurements of the criminals the act also allows any skilled person or a registered medical practitioner to take such measurements okay now moving on to see about the implementation of the act see to ensure the successful implementation of crpa act union home ministry has established a domain committee this committee has representatives from state police departments central law enforcement agencies and several other stakeholders this ensures cooperation and coordination across the law enforcement agencies this in turn ensures the successful implementation of crpa act note an important point here the national automated fingerprint identification system that is nafis is also being integrated with crpa act the nafis is a project under ncrb it was launched in 2022 the nafis assigns a unique 10 digit national fingerprint number to all suspects arrested by the police similarly the state police have their own fingerprint database see the main purpose of nafis is to enable the police to match a crime scene fingerprint with the country wide database now this nafis system is being integrated with the crpa act and this helps in the integration of various data under one single platform this in turn ensures the successful implementation of crpa act okay this is all about the important features of the criminal procedure identification act now finally let us see the challenges in implementing crpa act the first challenge is the threat to the right to privacy see the act enables the collection of critical biological samples so several activists have flagged that it will violate the fundamental rights of the citizens including the right to privacy this is the first challenge in the second challenge is lack of training and expertise see most of the police officials are not able to handle the complexity in obtaining measurements this is due to lack of training and expertise so this is also another challenge in implementing crpa act and finally lack of proper technology also poses a challenge for example there is no proper internet connection in the backward and northeastern states so in these types of areas the collection of samples using modern tools is not feasible okay so these are all some of the challenges in implementing crpa act and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion is all about the basics of criminal procedure identification act then you saw about the implementation of crpa act then you saw about important features of the crpa act and finally we saw some points regarding the challenges in implementing crpa act see this topic is important for both prelims and mains so make note of each and every points that we discussed now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this news article recently the pension fund regulatory and development authority that is the pfrda has created a penny drop verification process for pension sector see penny drop verification is a method used for validating bank account under this method a small amount of money is deposited into the customers bank account before transferring bulk amount it is done to check the authenticity of customers bank account now coming back to the news the pfrd has said that the penny drop verification process will be mandatory for people who want to withdraw their funds from national pension system note that the national pension system is a government sponsored pension scheme launched in 2004 for government employees okay this is all about the news now in this context let us understand important points about pension fund regulatory and development authority that is pfrda the pfrda was established in 
2014 under the Pension Fund Regulatory and Development Authority Act 2014. So it is a statutory body. The PFRDA was created to regulate, promote and ensure the growth of national pension system across the country. Note that PFRDA works under the Department of Financial Services which comes under the Ministry of Finance. The PFRDA is headquartered in New Delhi. Okay. This is all about the basics of PFRDA. Now what are the objectives of PFRDA? The PFRDA aims to promote old age income security by establishing, developing and regulating pension funds. Apart from this, the PFRDA also aims to protect the interests of subscribers to the pension fund schemes. Okay, this is all about the objectives. Now we will see the composition of PFRDA. The PFRDA consists of a chairperson and not more than six members. Out of the six members, at least three shall be whole time members. Both the chairperson and the members are appointed by the central government. Okay, this is all about the composition. Now finally, let us see the important functions performed by PFRDA. Firstly, the PFRDA regulates national pension system and other pension schemes to which PFRDA Act applies. Secondly, the PFRDA establishes, develop and regulate pension funds and it protects the interests of pension fund subscribers. Thirdly, PFRDA register and regulate the intermediaries in pension sector. It lays down norms for management of corpus of pension funds. Fourthly, the PFRDA also establishes grievance redressal mechanism for pension fund subscribers. It also involves in setting disputes among intermediaries and also between intermediaries and subscribers. Lastly, the PFRDA trains for intermediaries and it educate subscribers and the general public with respect to pension, retirement savings and related issues. Okay, these are all some of the important functions performed by the PFRDA. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the basics of PFRDA. Then we saw about the objectives and composition of PFRDA. And finally, we saw the functions performed by PFRDA. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next part of the video. That is to discuss preliminary practice questions. As friends, today we are having four questions. I will solve three of them and one will be a quiz question for you. Look at the first question. This question is regarding Mission Sakti scheme. Here three statements are given. We have to find how many of the statements are correct. Look at the first statement. It is a umbrella scheme for the safety, security and empowerment of women. See this statement is correct. Now coming to the second statement. The scheme will be implemented during the 15th finance commission period from 2021-22 to 2025-26. See this statement is also correct. Now coming to the third statement. It has two sub schemes Sambal and Samarthya. The Sambal sub scheme is for empowerment of women. The Samarthya sub scheme is for safety and security of women. See this statement is incorrect. The Sambal sub scheme is for safety and security of women. Whereas the Samarthya sub scheme is for empowerment of women. Here it is interchanged. Know that the Sambal sub scheme will include one stop center, women helpline, Beti Pachavo, Beti Padavo and Nari Adalats. Through these initiatives, the Sambal sub scheme aims to improve safety and security for women. While the Samarthya sub scheme will include National Kretche Scheme for Children for Working Mothers, Ujwala, Swadargrah, Working Women Hostel and Pradhan Mantri Matruvandana Yojana. Through these initiatives, the Samarthya sub scheme aims to empower the women. So third statement is incorrect. Here only two statements are correct. So the correct answer for the question is option B only two. Moving on, let's take up the second question. Here four options are given. We have to find which one of the options is the distinctive feature of Pallava architecture. Option A, the use of freestanding monolithic shrines and structural temples. Option B, the creation of pillared halls resembling Jain temples. Option C, the development of boundary walls and ritual pond inside the temple. Option D, the incorporation of wooden beams and columns in temple construction. The correct answer for the question is option B, the creation of pillared halls resembling Jain temples. See the rock cut face of Pallava architecture as pillared halls resembling Jain temples and also the construction of monolithic radhas alongside these pillar halls. So once again the correct option is option B. Moving on, let's take up the final question. I will read out the question. Which regulatory body in India is responsible for overseeing and regulating pension funds including the 
national pension system option a insurance regulatory and development authority option b reserve bank of india option c pension fund regulatory and development authority option d ministry of social justice and empowerment the correct answer is option c pension fund regulatory and development authority that is pfrda pfrda is responsible for overseeing and regulating pension funds including the national pension system in india this is a quiz question for you today i will post this quiz question in a community section try to answer it displayed here is a mains question for your practice go through the question write your answer and post it in the comment section with this we have come to the end of the video if you found our video to be useful do like comment and share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe shankar is academy youtube channel thank you for listening